Okay, it's the 15th of March 2019. I uh, woke up today to news that um, 49 people have been shot in a mosque in New Zealand. So it's a terrorist attack, but on this occasion it's a, a white dude machine gunning uh, Muslims, as we've had you know things like this before and we've had it the other way around and words get banded around like Islamophobia you know and they're all sort of very concerned and making making quite a bit out of this right rightly so you know this does warrant attention absolutely and occasions like this I'm tempted to sort of stay quiet out of uh, you know fear really that um, something I say could be um, misconstrued and used against me and I could be you know branded as someone who's trying to incite um, hate or anything like that which is absolutely untrue you know, for me, it's always about digging down and getting to the truth of things, right? So what happened today was obviously wrong. But then the authorities will come out and sort of say something to, you know, what must we do to solve this problem, you know? And in a sense, it's sort of, they want to do more of the censorship, more of the shutting down the discussion. Whereas I think what needs to be done is the absolute opposite. We need to talk about it. We need to get down to the nitty gritty. Now I think I will call this video the problem with religion. And I might include something else as a sort of a attention grabber. But it is a problem with religion. Well, it's not, you know, the, is the problem religion? No, absolutely not. If we had a world where nobody believed in God, um, I don't think we'd last very long at all. Now, there are bound to be people who argue with that, obviously, every single atheist. But then most of them kind of believe in science as their God, you know, in a sense that, you know, science is going to be their salvation. Yeah. It's going to save them. And religious people believe that you know they believe in a god and you know god is looking after them god is going to save them that's what i do every morning i wake up i say a prayer i say my own prayer i start it to the one eternal love i am grateful now because of my meditation the one eternal love to me is not so much an entity but it was it was the thing that it was always existed and will always exist. It's the thing that um, invented the concept of time. And, and it's the thing that found a way to create an entity so that love could exist and have experiences, you know, like forever. <laughs> like, you know, it's huge, right? It's huge. Anyway, so the one eternal love, I am grateful. I'm grateful that I exist. Thank you. And I am enjoying it. You know, I am, or I'm doing my best to enjoy it. It reminds me to be grateful. To the one eternal love, I am grateful. Thank you, Jesus, our mother and father. So I'm saying Jesus is the name of God. That's what I say, right? That's what I believe. Thank you, mother. Thank you, Jesus, our mother and father. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, and teach us how to love more, and help us to forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever, so be it. So I've modified my prayer to suit my personal feelings of what I know God is, our Creator. And so I've, I've adapted. I don't like to say amen at the end because I'm not absolutely sure why that's there. 
it's supposed to mean so be it, so I say so be it. And I like saying so be it, it's like putting my trust in God and at the end of the prayer, so be it. So let it be done, I'm in your hands. Whatever happens, I know it's part of your plan and I will do my best to do the right thing. So, you know, that's me, right? So, somebody else who believes in God and they live in a Muslim country and, you know, their interest is in God. Well, they've had it from their parents, but, you know, inside them they've got this belief. They believe in a creator, a maker, something that is outside of them. And, you know, you... You've got, low, oh, you know, and then the ground, oh, you believe in God, oh, good, you know, come to the mosque, right? Come to the mosque and hear about, hear the Imam talk, right? So they do that. So, you know, it's going to be difficult. They're not going to automatically assume, oh, this is all wrong, right? They go to the mosque and they they feel closer to God there. and And then the Imam's saying something and... And you know that might that might then it might trouble them. They might hear something that troubles them. Okay, this is a contentious point, but I think it should be aired. You know, um, they might hear that Muhammad's wife was only six years old when Muhammad married her, and nine years old when they had the first baby. You know, and that hearing that might might think first of all, guys weird um you know but because that is their accepted understanding of what's written in the history somewhere along the line when this devout religious person has now been going to the mosque for 30 years and um you know slowly 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 creep in it's okay to have sex with a 12 year old you know, Mohammed took his wife when she was six. Don't worry, I'm going to do the other side as well. Because there's, there's things in all the religions. There's, you know, wrong things in all the religions. So, like, someone put a comment the other day, you know, Jesus came to, not to bring peace, but to divide. And I replied, oh, that's utter crap. Can you back it up, right? And he, boom, comes out this verse, you know, Yeshua saying, and I, having read it then, I remembered I'd probably read that before. And, yeah, and I, and it, you know, sort of, I've, I've come to divide, to set the monks, this one amongst this one. And I'm just thinking, wow, you know, like, surely there's room for interpretation there. But why did he say that? So eventually I got back to him and said, you know, why? Why did he say that? And, um, you know, perhaps, you know, you can then read things into it because it, that does seem to contradict with the main message from Yeshua, which was, uh, you know, love your neighbor as yourself and stuff like that. Uh, love your enemy. And so, you know, I end up making a comment. Maybe it's because our last, you know, or uh, final challenge in love is to love someone even though they're not loving you you know is that the test or whatever which is possible but there's contradictions right and you know the whole the whole of the bible it seems to be anti-women and um the 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 quran also i don't think they you know the, the woman's place is there and you know maybe there's some Truth to it, I you know I can't comment on absolutely all of it. I've got to try and keep this keep this contained here. So what I'm saying is, you believe in God, you have a feeling you believe in God. So you go to the church or you go to the mosque, and you you feel a connection there. You feel something closer there because there's other people around who also believe in God. So you continue to do that, and you know so you get deeper and deeper into the religion. You've got this script which these religions ha have as God's word. You know, because I guess, you know, in the days of the prophets, 
you know, you could have several prophets and maybe they're not all saying the same thing, there's contradictions. Or one's claiming to be a prophet who isn't and there is a real prophet there and they're saying contradictory things, you know, how are you supposed to know which one? So things have become where they've been written down in a book and the people at the time, the, the most influential people were probably squabbling, you know, I don't know, what's the final message here that we're putting out? But then that book stays the same and doesn't get changed. Yes, it can be interpreted differently. But now this book is basically written in stone. And then people say, well, I'm not believing it because it's, you know, this is what's written in the book. I'll stick with that. So people are like hedging their bets, right? Whereas what they should be doing is everyone should be contacting their own heart. And probably most people are, you know, but, you know, it, the problem of religion is a problem of extremism in a way because well that's how the how the, you know in a sense you know how are we going to overcome this problem if if no one did a shooting if if we didn't have all those isis attacks uh, over the last few years if if we didn't have these muslim men grooming young girls in england you know if the problems had never become manifest, if they'd always stayed under the surface, then they'd never be fixed. We'd all be just walking around not doing what we want to do, um, and these problems remain under the surface. When people act, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not inciting anyone to act, but one that once they do, the problem comes above the surface, and we can start talking about it and tackling it. So the easy answer to all of this is everybody have their own God, their own personal God that they know inside. And if they choose not to accept that there's a God inside, well, that's their choice. And their life will feed back to them um, the results of their choice. And that's how we learn. seem like a bit of a rant now one religion isn't worse than the other well they're, they're just differently worse I got as I got more and more I, I was investigating uh, Christianity you, well I have my whole life I'm born in a Christian uh, Protestant place. I went to church at primary school, went on a Wednesday morning to church. Um, I used to like the stories. Yeah, I might used to find all the rest of it pretty boring, all the the Lamb of God. And <laughs> if you go to a church in Protestant, you hear a lot of the Lamb of God. And um, But I was investigating it more deeply a, few, a couple of years back through your two or three years ago and I was going to different churches around Banbury and um, you know they all signed up to this Nicene Creed and there's 39 articles in the Nicene Creed and this was this was battled out in the 1500s because there was all the Protestant movement the Calvinists and different ones and they were killing each other because of their disagreed on you know what God is right it's crazy isn't it it's crazy like, we all believe in God and we're going to love him but you've got it wrong I'm going to knock your head off and you know sometimes that is how it feels like I'm on YouTube and commenting and someone's with a few common beliefs but God why how can you believe that you know God you must be you know you can choose your words can't you but yes so they came up with this Nicene Creed. Now, if you read the Nicene Creed, um, those 39 points, I there's two lines of number one that I agreed with, like God is omnipresent and powerful and everything. And then I read the next few and I just disagreed with line after line after line, I, like properly disagreed, like no way. So there's no way I could then, after knowing that, 
join in with the Christian community and say, oh, I am a Christian. And, you know, there are plenty of other things that I disagreed with the Christian as well, you know. But there we go. That's what they had to do to prevent them killing each other. So, you know, I guess that's a good thing, isn't it? But it doesn't mean it should just last forever. I mean, it was like 500 years ago, so we can, we can perhaps we can move on. Um, so also in this investigation, I thought, well, I'll go to the Banbury Mosque and I'll see what that's like. Right? No, it was very good. It was very nice. Uh, I saw a couple of old schoolmates, and I liked the way they all um, kneel on the mat. And they line up, basically, so that um, when that come that time for prayer, you're, there's no there wasn't any gaps in between people. It was sort of it was a connection, so that all the Muslims all around the world at that time are praying. And you know, how can there be anything wrong with that? It's just really good. And I've never, you know, I've always found Muslims to be pretty peaceful. I think, you know, I, most of my encounters with them, one-to-one, -one, I found them to be really nice people. Um, but I'm not, like, close friends with any with anyone who's Muslim. But the service wasn't in English. Now, that's something that I think is wrong. You know, why, if there's a mosque in Banbury and anyone should be able to go along... But if you don't understand Urdu, I think it is, what they speak in Pakistan, you won't know what the Imam's saying. You know, is that right? No. I think that's wrong. I think one of the, if we're talking about, now we're talking about problems with multiculturalism, and I've heard someone saying that multicultural societies are less happy. Well, get your statistics out of here, right? It's very difficult. How can you put a statistic on happiness? Multiculturalism is good, right? It's definitely good that we mix together. You know, we can hold on to our cultures. You can dress how you like and all that sort of stuff, right? You can do any dance that you want, right? You can sing any song that you want, right? There's culture. But the integration was done so wrong, okay? I, when I grew up at primary school, nice little village primary school, I, I remember seeing one Pakistani. I didn't even know he was a Pakistani. He came into our class for a few weeks. He was really naughty, so we all thought he was really funny. And he was gone. Then we got to secondary school, and basically a quarter of the year were Pakistani. So every tutor group had you know so we were so my tutor group there's about there was less girls in my tutor group so you had like the girls and a couple of them were Pakistani then you had the the boys from Bodicut and Cheryl Heights <laughs> like the you know the richer ones that was me as well and you had the boys from Bretch Hill right? The not so rich ones, but you know, so we we were two separate groups. We obviously went to different primary schools, and then we had the Pakistanis, right? We'd never seen Pakistanis before, and when we were doing the original sort of day, first day, you know, just walking around the school and having a look, and the the group of Pakistani boys were walking out in front, and I ran up the line and I ran to the first one and I just touched him. And I remember looking him in the eyes as I touched him. His name's Tarek. And I ran back, oh, I touched a Pakistani. I probably said Paki, you know, because that's basically what we do. We had jokes about them and stuff. You know, this is this is a kid growing up. This isn't, you know, this isn't anyone who's got, you know, racist in their blood. Well, racism was my blood because my dad was pretty racist. He just racist in terms of that he saw people from other you know blacks and whatever he just saw them as lower form and that's the sort of racism that we've had in England going back you know these sort of things you know I oh, just 
blame it on one person or it's your fault. It's just the way it's been. So anyway, but five years in a tutor group, even though we stayed in our little groups mainly, we obviously did get to know each other a bit more. And I realised, you know, that my dad's wrong, that basically under the skin is just the same as anybody else. What's the difference? So that's how I grew up. I made my own decisions on that. And um, But although I would still laugh at the odd racist joke, you know, um, <clears throat> In fact, like my brother says, our joke banks <laughs> just got filled up with racist jokes. So we can't tell any jokes anymore because the only ones we can remember are the ones that <laughs> stuck in there. Anyway, you know, just stuff like making fun of how poorly you could treat a black person in South Africa this is what most of the jokes are about, calling them kaffirs. And you could, you know, how badly they would be treated and that it would seem normal. So there's a joke about, you know, there's a black guy in a prison cell and he's, there's a white guy in there as well. He's like, black guy, asks the white guy, well, what are you in here for? He's like, oh, oh no, how long are you in for? So like, you know, I've got two days I killed, I killed an old black woman, you know. And he asked the other white guy, well, you know, I've got, I got two days and I killed an old black man, you know. And they say to him, oh, what are you in here for? And he says, um, says oh, I've got 20 years. Like, wow, 20 years, what was that for? He's like, riding my bike without lights. And he's like, bloody lucky though, it was daytime, <laughs> right? As if, if he'd been riding his bike without lights at night time, he would have got 60 years. You know, it's, ri it's ridiculous. It's obviously ridiculous. The joke is there to be made fun of and it's there to be told between only white people you know a black person isn't gonna find that joke funny you saw me laugh it was a genuine little <laughs> snigger right find it a little bit funny because because that's how we did we did segregate we were seg we just we segregated and when this influx of um, Pakistanis came into our country, um, the integration could have been done better. It should have been done, and the, and the problem is, is that they tended to live in certain areas. So then, for the primary school, you know, you, we I remember play, we did play football against uh, Saint Leonard's primary school, and they were mostly Pakistanis. So I do remember that. So you know, because they were living in a certain area. Then they they're all going to that school, and that there wasn't integration with with the black kids, and there were much less black kids. Primary school, we had a couple of black kids. You know, so they had no choice. They couldn't just be in a group. If they'd been ten in a year, yeah, they probably would have stayed in a group, but they couldn't do that. It was too few, so they they had to integrate. And then then they grew up with white friends, black friends. Do you know what I mean? Whereas Whereas the Pakistanis mainly stayed together, and they got they had their own little caste system going on in there as well. Like I wasn't aware of it at the time, although the clues were there. But I've seen that afterwards that they they definitely know their pecking order, and we have the same we have pecking orders as well. Everyone's. <laughs> so. It's been this integration, and the religions obviously uh, keep us apart as well. Although what I was most surprised about when I first looked at the Quran was, oh, there's a chapter called Abraham. Oh, they even talk about Jesus and Mary. Oh, wow. And um, in fact, I think in their prophecy, in the uh, Islam takes over the world. This is their prophecy. Islam takes over the world, and and then and Jesus comes. So their their ultimate savior is also Jesus. So there's all these commonalities uh, with the with the religions, and both, you know, the both the Bible in the first the Bible the first God, the Genesis making the world and everything is called Elohim, which is plural. And you read the Quran, the first few chapters are all um, in the 
they say we. It's in that tense. We think this, and that's the most loving part of the Quran as well. It's the. It's the bit. It's like that's the bit. That's God's talking. That's the bit. That mother and father, God. Plural. Bible in begin Elohim, mother and father. Okay, made in our image. So obvious. If you're just prepared to think outside the box and not and not just assume that everything written in that book is God's word. You know, Christians will do this with letters of Paul, they'll give them almost as much uh, cre credence as, as the words of Yeshua. Which is crazy. Crazy. So, I, that's what I think. This, the problem with religion is you believe, you get that feeling, you believe, and and once you believe that yes, that church is important to you, and and there and there in that book there is the answers hidden for you to find. You know, you hold on to that belief, and that's when your belief system can go squiffy, and you can think it's all right to do something which is totally wrong, but you justify it because it's in the book or. Because, yeah, like that. Now, there are many people who probably think my way is way more dangerous. But I don't believe it is. And until we actually try it, you're not going to know. Because, you know, my way, everybody would be... A little discussion, because Alistair Crowley says, do as thou wilt, right? Well, I think that's good. I think, I haven't read the rest of the Satanic Bible, maybe I should, but... Do as thou wilt, right? You will soon see the results of what you do. We only learn by mistakes. So absolutely, do as you want. Do as I will. You will get the results of that. Because we're not bad, you know. We're not born with sin, as the Christians believe. I don't know what the Muslims believe about that. But I think, you know, if you you pray five times a day, I don't think they have a day off. I, think I like the day off. Or do they? Do they have Friday off? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think they do. Um, yeah, because, you know, if you knew the truth of what you were... That's why the, the believing in God is essential in the terms of... Because then you can believe that you've got a soul. That you've got something more than just this physical body. If you're just a Big Bang, uh, the Earth flukily got some bacteria growing on it, and, and now we're these beings but when I die that's it it's over no more me no more no more you know me that feeling the best way to prove you've got a soul is to sort of say well most people would think oh yeah well, like where I am where's me the me bits in my head or something but if you go a little bit deeper into more understanding and start getting involved with love and things like that, you'll soon realise that the me is here. And what's outside of me is God. There's God outside of me, bigger than me. And... Um, and I think we need that. I think we definitely, well, I know we need that. You know, any terms of wanting to get happier, you need that because God is your guide and teacher. You're not gonna, you're not gonna learn from anybody else. It's God who's gonna teach you, whether you like it or not. And um, you know, God's there in your dreams. God's there, you know, doing stuff with the scenery. <laughs> Some people have learned to control their dreams, so maybe they're not getting led by God in that situation. 
But then God will come into your life and start doing things that affect your life. You can't escape it really. So, And God absolutely loves you. The biggest problem with the Bible, I think, is you know when God becomes this just jealous and angry God and starts punishing and stuff like that. God's not like that. God's not like that. God is all loving. Always loving. Yeah. But you got to seek God, you know. Because because God is loving and punishing, you know, when you want to when you want to find your own way without God, God allows you to do that. So you have to you have to ask for it once you've said no to it. You have to ask for it to come back. Right. So some eyes. Bloke kills forty nine people in a mosque. He's obviously targeting Islam. It's called Islamophobia. Scared people who are scared of Islam. I don't think that's truth. It's not scared of Islam. We could find out that this man was trying to talk about these things. And maybe he got banned off Facebook. And maybe he got pissed off with it. And unluckily managed to get hold of a pretty powerful gun. If he killed 49 people, he must have had a lot of bullets. Um, and he'd just gone off on one, and just, you know, fuck it all, you know, I mean, it's happened, right? It's happened. Don't quash the free speech. Let people say what they think. Usually if you let people talk and their views are just wrong, that's the rope, you've given them the rope and they're hanging themselves with it. You know, you don't you don't need to get heavy on them, you know. Just let them have their say. People have their say, they get all this off their chest. When I was banned off Facebook for end up being, I don't know, sixteen hours or something. I um I was thinking, right, well, still on YouTube, alright, but you know, this is pissing me off. I, what if I needed to contact someone on Messenger and that's the only contact I have for them? It just cut me off. I sometimes speak to my son through the messaging on Instagram. Um, you know, cutting me off from that because he hasn't got credit, so he has to use things, different things. What did I think about doing? I thought about going into town into Banbury and having a bell or something. Ding! I've been banned from social media! Boom. They won't let me talk! Blah, blah, blah. You know, in a sense to, you know, if, if you're going to quell my free speech there, I'm going to go the next stage and, because I'm, you know, important. Free speech. Very. It is. <laughs> So, you know, I was thinking like that. I, whether I would have done it or not, I'm probably not that bothered. I probably just would have thought, fuck it. Still got YouTube. But if they'd knock me off YouTube as well, then I would I would be absolutely compelled to do something like that. And then what about if they lock me up for it? You know? Oh, you know, I'm a very placid guy, but lock me up. Make an enemy of me and... Yeah, I've got some... I've been in the army, right? <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's what fires the spirit if, if, they, if they do that. So don't fucking do it. And it's time we've got to fix this mass media and they're just being fed from the government what they can say and what they're going to make a big thing about. So many agendas going on. It's going down. You're going down, right? The Tommy, Tommy Robinson movement is a moving. And uh, it's about free speech. They're going to make it out that he's racist. They're going to make out he's Islamophobic. You know, just make up some new words. 
How about we make up some other, you know, we had the homophobic, that's one of the worst things to be, a homophobe, an Islamophobe. What about a, a, criti a critic phobe, you know, people who are phobias about people making criticisms? How about that? Yeah? We all have to accept a bit of criticism. You know, uh, this bloke on YouTube, when I said, oh, that's utter rubbish, utter crap about Yeshua coming to divide, and, and then he whacked the scripture back at me, you know, I said, I'm humbled, thank you. I obviously, I just, I fell for it, I jumped in there. I went too quick, thinking I was right thinking that he was wrong. You know, everybody's view is valid. Every single person, their own true heartfelt beliefs are valid. And nobody should be punished or quashed for their valid beliefs. We need debate. We need to debate. So, like I said, I was a bit fearful of doing a video about this and thinking of the timing, thinking people say, oh, you picked a day for it, oh, that's, that's out of order, you saying that on this day. Um, you know, maybe there should be some sort of time period where you, you wait a bit. But with all the things going on in the world, I don't think you can you can say that. I don't think you can. You just say it.